All right, Flashpoint, South China Sea. This is the one that was in route to me. I really wanted to check this game out. This is new from Harold Buchanan. Graphics by Terry Leeds. And it's a pretty slick looking package here. Let's just take a look at the contents here real quick. So you get your standard GMT box, 17 by 22 inch map. So call it half size uh, map sheet. Artwork on it is really, really nice. It's it's not gaudy. It's very pleasing. The palettes are the palette he was he used is very pleasing and just looks like something you want to get on the table and let's play this one. You got a whole set of cards. I think there's like 48 of these event cards of various different types. You have scoring cards and there are solo cards for the solitaire game. So this is 100% uh, solitaire friendly. In fact, let's take a look at that. There is a solitaire rules of play. Call it a 20 page rule book. These are color. I think Kai did the, uh, Kai Jensen did the, uh, the layout on these. These look, this looks really nice. So there's the solo. There is a playbook that's called 12 pages long. And this has got designer notes, information about the cards, things of that nature. You got the rules of play for the two player. This one is only, let's call this one 12 pages as well. And so all of your setup and everything, you, you can jump right into this one really uh, easy, it looks like. I was just glancing at the rules earlier tonight. It looks a like a very approachable game. There's a play aid for solitaire play. It is double-sided, but I think both sides are identical. Oh, no, it's uh, for U.S. opponent versus China opponent. There you go. And you also have a uh, player aid card for the two-player game. It is double-sided, and each player can have one of these. You also got 16 cubes, red and blue, and that's the contents of it. So it's a small, maybe, I'm not sure what people are expecting, but someone asked me if this had anything, to, if it was going to be like Next War Taiwan. Same theater, uh, same theme maybe, but uh, a totally different system. Let's put it that way. This is a much lighter weight game. Uh, playing time says to be 30 to 60 minutes. And that's just a quick look at the content. So next stage is to take a look at the game and let's figure out how to play this one. All right, so I got the game set up right now. It looks really nice on the table. Now I set it up a little bit different than how they have it in the rule book. The rule book shows you how to lay everything out and gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to set everything up. It's great, easy to jump right into. But the scorecards I find for, at least for filming, anyways, we'll put them down here along the, uh, the leading edge to make them a little bit easier to read. Basically, the, the board consists of a series of uh, countries that have a number of tracks on them. There's a score track that centers on zero. 15 is an auto victory for the U.S. or for China, depending on the side of the board that the score track uh, marker goes to. The... Countries are from the bottom to the top. It's going to be Indonesia, Brunei, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. Five countries. Three of them have a um, an island group, a contested island group that is associated with it. So they have some extra spaces. So each of these blue spaces is a place where a cube can go. If you already have for example, three cubes in the economic portion of the Philippines, you cannot cram a fourth one in there. Okay, that's, that's a limitation. The economic and diplomatic spaces in countries are where influence cubes are placed, and that's the majority of the spaces. Now, in the island groups like the Spratly, Paracel, and Scarborough Shoals, these are uh, where uh, Chinese reclamation or CR cubes are going to be placed, or where FONOP, or Freedom of Navigation Operation, cubes are placed for the, uh, for the U.S. So it's, it's a little bit different than influence. This is more where military uh, operations are going to take place. Each space has also has, or I should say, each country also has a lock cube. 
uh, space where if you do a successful political warfare operation, you can place one of your available cubes into that space. You can then eliminate all of your opponent's economic or diplomatic cubes when, when you do that, and you make it impossible for the opponent to place their own cubes in those influence spaces uh, without the play of an event. So you can't use your op value, in other words, to place them in there. So that's that's what's going on with the map. There's a little campaign track, a tension track that slides from low to critical. Each spot also has, or each country also has a spot for available cubes, reserve cubes, and three spaces for political warfare cubes. And we'll show you how those work as we go. So this is the beginning setup. Each side then has a ability to place four additional cubes as they so desire. After looking at their opening hand of six cards, they can go ahead and place these cubes onto the map. So um, China gets to place theirs first. I would, and they have to be placed in diplomatic or economic uh, spaces. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this there. There. Uh, let's go ahead and hit this one twice, actually, and then maybe put throw this one down here. Yeah, throw that one into Brunei under economic. Okay, so that's what I went ahead and did with China. I didn't put a whole lot of thought into that, and I didn't tell you why I did those. Uh, mainly it's because I'm, I'm just looking at the cards in the... Chinese player's hand. I've already looked at them, and I feel like that's probably, I don't know, I'm not an expert on the game, but it's, it seemed to me a good idea to place them uh, accordingly. So you can look at your opening hand and use that to dictate where you're going to place your opening cubes. So for the, uh, for the Americans, then they can go ahead and begin to place their own four, and you can pretty much see whatever they did and, and uh, counter it, perhaps. Um, maybe we'll go counter there, maybe jump into Indonesia here like so. Okay, so they place there for, so that gives variability to the setup. The setup's not gonna be identical every single time unless you as a player always place them in the same places, uh, which you know may develop that that's a, a style of play that you prefer. So there is your setup. Victory track is done a little bit differently. What you do with the victory track is you bid for who gets to play China. So you secretly, before you even put your cubes out, you secretly um, uh, bid a number of points that you're willing to concede to in order to play China. Just for the purposes of this video series, I'm going to go ahead and put them on four, uh, assuming that uh, four points were bid in order to play China, and you won that bid. Let's go ahead and put them there and see what happens. All the score cards are arranged face up, and so in our next segment, what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at the cards, the card play, and uh, see how the game flows. All right, so these are the cards that the Chinese player drew into hand. You see there are uh, four U.S.-oriented cards and two Chinese-oriented cards. So each card is going to have a quite a bit of information on it compared to other games maybe of this particular weight. Uh, the U.S. has drawn two Chinese-oriented cards, two American, and two unaligned cards into their hand. So these are the starting hands. The uh, first player to go is, let's see, whoever is, has the fewest VPs, so that would be China right now, because the U.S. has four VPs, obviously. China gets to decide if they want to go first or if they want to go second in the turn. So let's look at the cards and see what you can do with them. Let's just use this as an example. This is protest by Chinese veterans over pensions distract Beijing. Wordy title. Each card is going to have an op value of either one, two, or three. It will be oriented by a colored stripe, either with the US for blue or China with red. And so this is a US oriented event. It has an op value of three. Each card then has a mode icon and there will be one of three modes. I do not remember what the, um, uh, what the symbols represent here, but there's like a dollar sign, which I believe is your economy. And I think this, uh, this is politics. I think that's economy. And the other one is military. You see the, uh, the F-22. So those are your three different modes. That will become important as we uh, we go a little bit further into gameplay.
So you have an out value of three. This one's got a political mode. Each card will then be oriented with a country down the lower left-hand corner, and that is for scoring purposes. So one of the things is that you can do with the card is you can play this for scoring purposes. And then finally, there is an event with text and a card number. So how the game works is when it's your turn to play a card, let's say it's China's turn to play a card, they can pick a card from their hand, you can play it for its event if it's oriented with your side. So for China, maybe they want to use checkbook diplomacy. If they play this card, they can choose to play the event. You may also choose instead to play the up value and you have a whole menu of operations that you can do on this chart. You can place influence, you can move cubes from reserve to available so that you can use them in subsequent operations to put on the map. You can uh, place font ops or to increase tension if you're the US. You can also uh, place Chinese reclamation in order to place cubes in those spaces if you're China. Uh, these two operations depend much on the tension levels. The tension level ratchets up, uh, it may become not possible to play it, or it may become more expensive to play a card for its up value and place a, uh, a CR cube. You may also place a cube into political warfare, one of those three spots on your, uh, your little display on the map. And the purpose of that is to engage in a uh, political warfare operation. So you can use your ops to place PW cubes. You can also resolve PW and uh, political warfare. And that is basically taking pre-placed cubes and uh, then engaging in uh, political warfare. And I'll show you how the operation works a little bit later. So all of these, we'll walk you through how all of these work. But basically, that's what you're going to use the numbered value on the card. So you can play it for the event. You play it for the op value and do one of these things, one or more of these things. You don't have to pick just one. You can mix and match as you desire. You can also play a card. Let's say that uh, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the, do the top deck, uh, top card of the discard pile. So let's just imagine for a second that this was the top card of the discard pile. You look at the mode on the top of the discard pile. If you have a card in your hand that has a matching mode, you may play this card for a mode match in order to do one of two things. You can either trigger the event that is oriented with you. So if I was, say I was the US player and I had this card in my hand, I could play this card because I can't use the event, but I could use the ops, but maybe I just want to use the mode and trigger the event that's at the top of the discard that my opponent so graciously left there. So it's kind of a way of triggering your opponent's events, kind of like what you'd see in Twilight Struggle or Labyrinth, um, 1960, games of that sort. It's it's similar. Probably feel, to me, it feels a little bit more similar to um, how it works in 1960. So you can play a mode match to trigger an event, or you can play a mode match. I could, If I was a U.S. player, I could dump this card. I have a mode match to the top of the discard in order to score the scoring effect on the top card of the discard pile. And that would basically mean I go over here to the score card and I resolve it. Once I resolve it, I flip it over so it can't be resolved again this turn. Or this campaign, I should say. So you have events, ops, mode match. Last thing you do with a card, and you know, if you didn't want to do any of those things, I could plop this card down and I could choose to score that particular card if it's face up here. And again, anytime you're scoring it, the card has to be face up for it to be a valid score. So I could play this card for Indonesia and try to score Indonesia, and that would be my sole card play for the turn. So again, you have to decide between all of these. I either play the event, or I use the ops, or I do a mode match, or I will uh, try to score and, uh, and get some points. So that's the function of the cards. That's how the cards work in the game. So like I said in one of my Twitter posts, this is a really smart game. It looks simple, maybe even simplistic, but there's a lot of smart uh, gameplay here. Harold's done a lot with a little here. That's that's my, been my uh, initial takeaway, is that this game is very approachable. It's very easy to learn, but it's a real smart game, and um, it's going to force some really tough decisions. He does a lot with a little here. So that's how card play works. Let's uh, let's look at the op menu and see how these operations work and we'll, we'll just work through some card plays and uh, maybe get a little sample game going. 
Okay, so we looked in the last video at the different uh, things that you can do with the cards. This is the Chinese hand of cards. And I think it might just be fun to go ahead and go first with China. We'll just see where that takes us. We've got a couple events for China that will place economic and diplomatic influence down. It would be tempting to play that early, but I think I'm going to go ahead and forgo that for the moment. Instead, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to do an aggressive opening move, and I'm going to do what's called political warfare. So to do this, I'm going to take this card. It's got an up value of three, and I'm going to play it for its ups. There's no card to discard, so I can't play a mode card right now. And there's no reason to play a score card because in order to score, you've got to have more cubes than your opponent in that country. That also includes the lock space and any attached island group. So right now it's four to four. There's no sense in playing a score, but I'm going to go ahead and play the op value for three. And I'm going to do a real aggressive move here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to flop down. I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to take uh, two cube, or I'm going to take one cube out, and I'm going to go ahead and put them in the Philippines here. And I'm going to increase the tension by one. I'm going to do a fawn op operation. A fawn op operation has no re prerequisite. At low tension, it only costs, or excuse me, I'm going to do a CR, not fawn op. I'm doing a CR. That's Chinese reclamation operation. There's no prerequisite. Only costs me one op two of my three in order to place a cube there. And one of the results of this is it's going to increase tension by plus one. So we're going to move the tension up to one. Now, the next time I go to do one, it's going to cost me two ops. Now, I could spend both ops and put another cube down, but I'm going to do something else. I'm going to engage in political warfare. I'm going to take my last two ops and put two cubes into the political warfare spot on my map. Now, if you look at here, it says I can place political warfare. Uh, it only costs me one cube to do it. doesn't matter the tension level. I can have that ready to go. For zero operations, at, we're not at medium tension, I can now choose to try to uh, resolve political warfare. Now, this is where there's some risk involved. In order to be successful, I must draw a card off of the deck, and it must have an op value um, less than or equal to the number of cubes in this spot. So if I, if I drew, like, a, uh, for example, if I played all three cubes in there, it would be a guaranteed success. But with two of them in there, there's a chance that I will fail. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the card off of here, and it is a one card. So it is less than the number of cubes. It is a success, so we flip it face down, goes under the draw pile, and basically that's your random number generator in the game. These now go back to available. Tension increases by one. And then I take one of my available cubes, and I can lock a country, and I want to lock the Philippines. I then do something particularly nasty to my opponent. I remove uh, all of his either economic or dip, uh, diplomatic cubes from the, uh, from the space. Now, here's where I have a tricky choice. If I remove all the economy, now I've got one country at least where I have more economic cubes than my opponent, and that sets me up to score points with the economic scorecard. On the other hand, Every at the end of the uh, the campaign, they will everybody loses one cube off of here, anyways. So it, he's going to regress there automatically at the end of every turn. So it might be easier, it might be better to get rid of the diplomatic cubes because these are going to kind of siphon off as the game uh, progresses. So I'm going to go ahead and actually do that. These will go back to his available. And now here's the real tough thing for the Americans: they cannot use ops to place any cubes in here. And we've increased the tension now to high. So if they do a freedom of navigation operation in the in the Scarborough Shoal, they're going to put it up to critical. That's going to for any time this goes to critical, whoever plays that card puts a cube into reserve. And it's no longer available to them. So they got to spend ops to get these back out of there. Furthermore, I would still have the lead. I got two, four, five, six to two. So I got a four cube lead, setting me up for as China for the. Philippine scorecard, which can score a maximum of three three victory points. So you're looking at the differential between red and, and blue cubes. So even though I got a differential four right now, if at the start of my next turn I could score that, I would still only score three. So that is the end of my card play. This gets discarded. 
and now it's over to my opponent. So in this, what we've looked at is we looked at how to do a uh, Chinese reclamation operation, political warfare. We looked at how to resolve political warfare. There's a few more ops, and we'll look at those as we continue. Well, now let's look at the American hand and see what kind of cards we've got here and what sort of options we have as the U.S. side. We can see here that we do have one card that has the political mode on it. And the Typhoon event might be useful if there was a bad turnaround in points this turn, but because the U.S. is ahead in points, the Typhoon card doesn't really it doesn't really help us because it's only valuable if you're behind in VP. So I uh, can't really use that to, uh, to any advantage at the moment. But the mode does match the card that was discarded. But this one says if the U.S. has more than seven diplomatic influence, place three U.S. influence and move one Chinese economic influence to available. So that's a pretty potent event. But if I look at the board situation, I only see, I don't see any diplomatic um, influence at all. So that card's not playable. So using a mode won't help us at this point. I also don't see any advantageous situation where playing a scoring card um, would be helpful. So, and the Philippines is locked, so I can't put influence down in there. Although I could run a fawn up operation in Scarville Show. Uh, I could do that. It would bring the tension track to critical, which then keeps the uh, uh, the Chinese from doing that, uh, uh, from, from doing any more uh, reclamation operations. But I also have an event here that might be of use. Um, looking at this, looking at these two events, place two U.S. diplomatic influence. Then if the U.S. has most diplomatic influence, U.S. receives one victory point. Right now, the Chinese have two, three total diplomatic influence between the Philippines and Indonesia. So that card would not be, um, it wouldn't be a great play right now. This one, U.S. accuses China of major human rights violations. Move one Chinese diplomatic influence to available. Place two U.S. diplomatic influence. I think this is a great play right now. I'll show you why. Again, I'm not an expert, but to me this feels like a good play, so let's do it. Uh, I'm going to play this one because I can take one Chinese diplomatic influence out of the Philippines. That changes now the differential from three, four, five, four, three, from a plus three in China's favor, um, or plus four to, to a plus three in China's favor. So the differential has been uh, uh, reduced. So now they only have a three cube advantage in the Philippines. Then I can take two U.S. available cubes. By the way, if you do not have available cubes, you can't take them out of reserve, but you can take them out of another location and reposition it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two cubes from available, and I'm going to throw them into diplomatic. There we go. That brings us up to not quite parity, but at least, you know, China's not going to score a truckload of points out of that if they choose to score the Philippines next. And this card will then be discarded. So that shows you how events can work. Now we're back over to the Chinese. I think we've done all of those. Let's do a scorecard. This is a good scorecard. Let's go ahead and throw this one down. Uh, since the U.S. did not activate a mode in the last card, I feel like, well, maybe they don't have one, um, a mode card, or it's possible they saw the card's not playable. That's true, too. Uh, but maybe I'll just not worry about the fact that this is a U.S. allied uh, or U.S. aligned card. And let's go ahead and play the Philippines card right now for the flag or VP effect. So we look over here, we count one, two, three, four, five Chinese to four Philippines. That isn't a lot, but we score one card and then that card is now done for the rest of the campaign. And so campaign being like the, uh, a hand. think of campaign as a hand of cards, okay? So for the rest of this hand, that card is now out of play and we shift the VP marker to the three spot. And so that's how scoring works. Come back over to the US. Now we're still holding on to that Typhoon card, which we can use as a match. So let's just see what this one does. It says move all, move all Chinese economic influence from Philippines to available and increase the tension. Hmm. Well, 
That takes out all of his economic influence, puts us in position to, to score Philippines on the, in, the uh, economic influence uh, score, uh, scoring, uh, scoring card. Hmm, do I do that? I would have preferred to have done that before now. It's like you, you do that either now or never. Well, given that this card's not terribly valuable uh, in light of its event, I think that now's a good time to go ahead and play that and just put them behind in the Philippines. Maybe make them think about keep playing there, even though that card is scored for this campaign. Um, seems like a, a reasonable card play. So let's go ahead and throw that in there to activate the mode. Move all Chinese economic influence from Philippines to available. So, psh, oh, Chinese. Those come out to available. So now that's been taken care of. Tension increases. Now we played the card to increase the tension. So we do have to put a reserve, uh, one of our available cubes into reserve. And uh, so that is the end of that card play. So now we've shown events. We've shown a couple of ops. Let's do some more ops here for China. What haven't we done yet? We haven't placed influence down by uh, by way of event. We have done political warfare and ex executed those. We've done a CR event. Uh, let's go ahead and do a couple of. Let's see what 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 opportunities we have to score. We have the opportunity maybe to score in Indonesia. So, and all of our modes are the same. So unless, you know, there's a, you know, a scoring opportunity ends up in the discard pile, um, there's not a whole lot of scoring opportunities. Brunei can only give us a most of, uh, at most it'll give us one point for China. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and do this. If they trigger the event, it decreases the tension, which could help um, China out a little bit. We need to get the tension reduced down below high in order to place any more um, of our Chinese reclamation uh, operations. So let's go ahead and use this for two ops. And I think what we'll go ahead and do with that is place some influence. And we can place this place back into right back into, into the Philippines. I know it already scored, but I don't want to give them an opportunity to get a point back by playing the economy card. So we'll just basically cancel out what they just did. So China just reacted to the US play. So there has been a little bit of shift in initiative there. So that that's basically how you place influence. And by the way, we saw how you can mix and match things. So I could have put, you know, maybe one in economic, one in diplomatic. I put one in here, maybe one in another country. Or maybe I just place one of those and then maybe take one of my cubes out of reserve. Just something I'm thinking about doing as the U.S. Um, I think I'm going to try to score with this guy right here. So... But before I do that, let me check the mode really quick. Move three Chinese economic influence to available. Move one U.S. economic influence to available. So basically, and decreases tension. Hmm. That's tempting. Basically, everybody's going to lose some uh, some economy, but that might be a useful that might be a useful play. Tell you what, let's go ahead and take that. Let's go ahead and take that play for now. I'm going to trigger with the mode. I'm going to trigger the um, COVID-19 outbreak in China. Decreases the tension down to high. Then we're going to take three Chinese economic influence out. I'm going to take two out of the Philippines, and I'm going to take one out of Brunei. I think that's, yeah, I think that'll be good. Those go to available. I gotta take one US out. So let's take a one US out of the uh, Philippines, back to available. So COVID-19 outbreak resolved, back over to China. Tensions are high, but I don't have a three up card to place down a, uh, uh, a Chinese reclamation operation. So my options are more economic or diplomatic influence. 
Um, oh, let me just address this. This card is at the, the top of the discard pile. I would really like to trigger the event, but the event is not allied with either player. So you, I don't believe you can do a mode match to uh, execute a black stripe card. It has to be a friendly card at the top of the discard pile. All right, so we have, we can put three, we can put all of our econ economic stuff back with this or diplomatic with this. If I was playing as, as the Chinese, I would be afraid the U.S. is about to score another point. I don't want them to get that point back. We chipped away at their lead here. So I would be inclined to play this card now to place three Chinese economic influence in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei. Uh, that'll take away... Yeah, right now, if the if the scorecard for economy were to score, the U.S. would get one, two, three points for the Philippines, Brunei, and Indonesia. Um, this will offset that, I think. So let's play that. Let's get three cubes out. And we're going to go ahead and put one in Indonesia, Brunei, and Malaysia. So if the U.S. plays the, that, that scorecard now, they'll score a point for the Philippines. China will score one for Malaysia, and they offset. So no point differential. And that's it for them. So now they've executed one of their own events. This is a good time, I think, to play um, uh, the U.N. action petitioned. So we're going to place two U.S. diplomatic. Let's see. We want to go... Show you what I'm going to do. This they might score Indonesia. I'd be afraid they might score a point for Indonesia, but I can set up a play for Malaysia with this, and I have the most. And they're going. To, the U.S. will get a point for this because they have the most diplomatic influence on the board. There's two, four. China only has one and two. So per the event, U.S. gets one point back. So a couple event plays there. Uh, the Chinese can try to play for uh, for a point in Brunei. And might be useful just to go ahead and play this card for the event. Three Chinese diplomatic influence. Let's go with Brunei. We can only hold one. Um, let's take Malaysia. I don't want them to score that. Two. And maybe put the third one, put, put this up ahead in uh, Vietnam. So set up that situation there. Back over to the USA. And now they have dangerous events that they have to watch out for. Uh, don't want China to, uh, to play any of these, if at all possible. Um, I just took away my play in Malaysia. But... I think it might be worthwhile to take a stab at... Um, Let's go ahead and try this. I think if we go ahead, I think if they were gonna place Chinese reclamations with a three up card, they would have done so already. So I'm gonna risk that they're not gonna do that in my last play. Instead, I'm gonna go ahead and pull one out of reserve. So I took one of my cubes from reserve into available. That's one up. My other two ups, I'm gonna stick these guys here. And then I'm going to try another political warfare. Go ahead and execute. I could have, I got greedy with it. Oh, we made it. So this, a two is a success. A three would have been a failure. We didn't want to draw a three there. And so these guys go back into here. One comes out. We lock up Malaysia and we take out all of its um, economic support. And go ahead and throw this guy into the discard. And hope for the best here. China's got one card, it's a U.S. card. Um, a couple things I could do with it. I could just, you know, try to, uh, you know, put some more influence down somewhere. I can't. Oh, and uh, this should go back up. And one more to reserve. So, because we went, the U.S. executed that. So that should go to critical and we should have one in reserve. So now the U.S., or excuse me, the, the China's got one last U.S. card. Let's go ahead and take Brunei and score it. So we're gonna throw this down for a scorecard because we got a, um, we have a lead. And I'll show you what this will do. Do a, a couple two cool things. 
you look at the card here, it says you score according to the differential maximum of one VP. Scoring side moves one cube from reserve to available. So it's kind of a two for one shot with that card. So I think that's a good play. Flip them face down. Get my camera to focus. Sometimes it doesn't want to focus. All right. So he comes back and reserve. So in terms of reserve, China's in a good solid place for the future. So they, and they get, did get the one VP back. But the U.S. does have the ability to score some good points out of Malaysia. So they're going to go ahead and play that now. They don't have a mode effect to trigger the event. And in any case, this is the optimal play, obviously. So we're going to play it for its victory points. One, two, three, four, down to three. I think Malaysia scores a max two. So we'll get two out of Malaysia. And there we go. Turn ends with U.S. having a net gain of one VP over the course of the campaign. And now we go to the sequence of actions here. Next thing we're going to do is each side is going to draw six cards. I'm not going to do that in this video, but basically you draw a new hand of cards. There's not enough cards in a deck for the need of a reshuffle. So let me just say that now. Turn all scoring cards face up. So all three cards that scored last turn, they get flipped back to their face up side. Then we come back over. Move all lock and fawn op cubes back to available. So if the US had done any fawn ops, those would be removed. But we do remove the locks from both China and the USA on the Philippines and Malaysia. So those guys get out of there. Each side moves one friendly economic influence cube in each country to that side's available space. So everybody loses one cube from the economy of every nation. That's another way of understanding it. So we'll do the U.S. first. Boom. Basically, you got to keep spending money on these countries. So it, this is a really smart, elegant system. I, I love the thought that went into this. The effect achieved by this is just so simple and yet it's very elegant so u.s lost uh, some cubes china loses some cubes so that's the attrition of the economy you have to keep spending money on those guys tension level moves one to the left so from critical down to high so it's still expensive for china to maintain um or, or to execute its operations in these uh, island groups and the scarborough shoal and then the last thing we're going to do for the turn is, or for the campaign, is advance the campaign marker, and then we would be ready to do the next turn. I think we showed everything that is in the game except for a FONOP operation. A FONOP works exactly like a Chinese reclamation operation. It costs the U.S. one, um, one op point. You put it down in one of those island groups. You increase the tension. The cost of the operation is always one for the U.S., but just bear in mind, these are temporary. They will go away at the end of the turn uh, or at the end of campaigns one and two. Now, at the end of campaign three, they do stay in place. So that is important. The final scoring can be huge. So do pay attention uh, to the sequence of play because after the third campaign is done, all scoring cards get placed face up and they each score in numeric order. So do be aware Every card will score once you finish up that third campaign. So that is Flashpoint South China Sea by GMT Games, Harold Buchanan Designer. This is how you play the two-player game. Now, in my next video, it'll be a lot shorter, but we're just going to focus on the solitaire rules of play because it's got its own rule book, a set of eight cards to help guide you along, and it's a pretty nifty system.